That feeling when someone who's been rooting against you for so long finally sees how successful you've become. And you know, we know each other. We go way back all the way to Chad Science in Newark, okay? What a corny kid, right? <laughs> no, I did not say that. Favorite restaurant here? Oh uh, man, uh, whatever hotel I'm in, their restaurant. <laughs> well, you're not corny anymore. <laughs> On the way to our success though, there are people and bullies who will try and do everything in their power to take us down. That is why this video is going to break down the bulletproof machines and frameworks that stop bullies in their tracks from forming false narratives, allowing you to reclaim your story and your reputation. This is a universal lesson that does not just apply to bullies. This is a masterclass on managing the everyday confrontations we have in our lives and in detecting deception. When we don't put effort into reclaiming our stories and our reputations, they become vulnerable to being hijacked and controlled by deceptive bullies. The actor Michael B. Jordan is on the red carpet and runs into an interviewer who used to bully him in high school. In a desperate attempt to try not to look bad, she tries to spin false narratives, but Michael is able to confront her in a professional manner that wins over the audience. Afterwards, we will break down her briefing of the interaction as she again tries to spin masterful webs of deception that require a complex defense in order to defeat. The first machine of maneuvering confrontation is five parts. The second machine of deception awareness is also five parts. As the interaction begins, see if you can spot the first part of the first machine of maneuvering confrontation. Mona Hustle Show, we got Michael B. Jordan, the director and the star of Creed 3. And you know, we know each other. We go way back all the way to Chad Science in Newark. Michael goes into the interaction with one eyebrow down and one eyebrow up. His head is tilted down as well, and he is very still the whole time while she is talking. As we cock one eyebrow up, our other eyebrow typically lowers, which allows the eyebrows to represent both aggression and surprise at the same time due to the division of high and low. When mixed, it indicates suspicion and skepticism. Skepticism is also represented through the combinations of tilting the head to the side, squinting the eyes, and pursing the lips. The first step is to send the immediate implicit message of suspicion. Michael's physical stillness is indicative that he has prepared and has intent behind what he is about to say. This physical stillness combined with the rigid and rapid tilt of the head cues us into the reality of the seriousness of the underlying tension that exists here. This is not a relaxed environment, which is why her reaction here is so telling and is an immediate set off. See if you can spot exactly why. And you know, we know each other. We go way back all the way to Chad Science in Newark, okay? What a corny kid, right? <laughs> no, I did not say that. Misquoted for sure. Now, she was not the actual person that said that. She was complicit with someone who said that. And Michael isn't directly calling her out, but merely confronting a comment that she agreed with. And her laughter gives everything away. The quickness in which she laughs shows us that she was expecting him to say that. She already has a response immediately ready to go. Given the nature of Michael's statement being confrontational when he says, the corny kid, right? An honest person would be taken aback and at least take a second before confusedly saying, wait, what? An honest person would do this because their mindset would be one of rejoice, seeing them for the first time in a long time. To be targeted with confrontational energy and language would throw even the most balanced and honest person off, even if it was just for a second. But we see her just glide right past it laughing. She's trying to frame the conversation as if this is some sort of reunion, but does not react as someone at a joyful reunion would. She doesn't make a defense for herself and instead starts immediately laughing? The second part of the machine of maneuvering confrontation is to notice the implicit signs of guilt. Typically, we flash both our eyebrows to communicate to our counterparty some form of the message, I see you and it is usually used as an introduction. However, instead of using it as a greeting, Michael uses it here to say, I see what you are trying to do. I see through your facade. After implicitly calling out her facade, pay close attention to the third tactic that allows Michael more room to be fully confrontational. Smash the like button, comment, and subscribe because you are the reason I am here. Okay. What a corny kid, right? <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> no, I did not say no, that. Misquoted for sure. No, no, you did not hear me say. No, I said no, we no, used no, to no. make fun of the What's name, up? Up? but yeah, he is obviously killing things out here. We typically lower our eyebrows and squish our face together as a symptom of anger, authority, and dominance. Michael is able to use his vocal and facial expressions to stand his ground without negative reactions from everyone around him. This is because he has afforded himself extra margin of confrontation through his physical positioning. Pay close attention to the angle that Michael B. Jordan is physically standing at. By standing at an angle instead of head on, he is implicitly signaling to her and to everyone in the vicinity that is watching that there is not going to be a physical or violent confrontation. And it is because of this that he is afforded more room to be verbally confrontational. The larger we are physically to our counterparty, the less leniency we are offered in the eyes of the public in the event of a confrontation. When someone much physically larger begins to confront someone who is much smaller than them, it is to the larger person's advantage to not be physically threatening. And what that larger person sacrifices in physical confrontation, they are awarded with a larger margin to be conversationally confrontational while still being viewed positively by onlookers. After verbally attempting to demolish her facade, he now couples it with an indirect touch. His what's up as he taps her is another avenue and attempt to tear down her emotional facade that everything is alright. Instead of using his hands to touch her, he touches his elbow to her elbow, one of the most impersonal parts of the body. Wanting to keep your touches as impersonal as possible again serves as an indicator of that growing tension and confrontation. It also reveals to us that he's not tapping her in a friendly, what's up, how you doing type of way, but in a, I'm here now, what's up, drop the facade type of way. The third part of this machine is to be conversationally confrontational, but physically disconnected. We then see him immediately wink, another acknowledgement of, I got you. However, she still doesn't budge, and as she refuses to drop the facade, watch closely as Michael B. Jordan increases the temperature and makes a masterful next step in handling this confrontation. How is the difference between you actually directing and working with the same people that you were directed with versus? Uh, it, it was it was awesome. You know, I'm having, it's a family vibe. They, they, they loved it. They embraced it. And uh, it was a wonderful experience. And was it difficult for you mentally because you're coming out of a different space? I didn't, know, I didn't know what he was doing. I had to let it kill. I mean, I was staying in it. This is about show. This ain't about Isn't this the sexiest man uh, right show here. off right here? Yeah. Who's the sexiest man? Because now let's. What kind of question is that? Who's the sexiest man? Sorry. Good luck with that. <laughs> <laughs> love you, bro. Okay, so you also are going- Michael sees his friend Jonathan out of his peripherals and chooses to initiate. Jonathan's surprise here tells us that he didn't know Michael was there at first. Michael's initiation here is very important because of the fact that he does it in the middle of her question while she is addressing him. This move is what allows Michael to subtly display his distaste and distrust of her, not only to her face, but also to everyone in the vicinity and everyone watching. With this move, he implicitly tells her that you can pretend everything is cool, but I'm not going to give you my respect. And implicitly tells the audience that I don't readily accept or respect people that do these things to me. When she says, isn't this the sexiest man? She is trying to appeal to Michael in order to draw him back in and gain back control of the interaction. Through this tactic, she is trying to win back Michael's attention through flattery and shock. However, once his friend leaves, Michael immediately goes back to that disposition of complete and utter suspicion and discontent. This further confirms to us that his feelings right now are not just a result of his mood or are, are associated with anyone else. No, his suspicion and confrontational energy here is purely targeted at her. The fourth part of this machine is to subtly show signs of distaste and distrust. Before going into a complete breakdown of her impressive attempts at deception, there is one more powerful part in this first machine that allows Michael to victoriously end this interaction. If you're a subscriber, I have a gift for you in the description. Check it out. You're really going to like it. So Atlanta's a second home to me, and I, I love coming down here. Favorite restaurant here? Oh, uh, man. Uh, whatever hotel I'm in, their restaurant. <laughs> well, you're not corny anymore. <laughs>
Michael B. Jordan physically departs before he begins to verbally say goodbye. When he does verbally say goodbye, he doesn't look her in the eyes. The beginnings and the ends of our interactions are points of emotional connection. In the beginning of an interaction, eye contact is used as a check to make sure everything is alright. As interactions conclude, eye contact serves as a final check, ensuring that the conversation has been satisfactory and that there are no unresolved issues. This eye contact, paired with verbal goodbyes, helps confirm mutual understanding and a readiness to part ways. It can also reinforce social bonds by conveying warmth and sincerity at the moment of departure. In this way, Michael B. Jordan assists in getting his distaste across, in one final sweeping grand gesture, communicating to her that I don't care how you think this interview went, your opinion is not of consequence to me and at the same time letting the onlookers know that these things won't be tolerated and if you try to pretend like everything is nice i will confront your facade in a multitude of ways before departing from you in a way that leads to your embarrassment the fifth part in the machine of maneuvering confrontation is departing powerfully while emotionally disconnected now afterwards, when she gives a brief on her perspective of the interaction, she intelligently tries to deceive the audience into taking her side. It is here that we uncover each one of her deceptive tactics so that we can save ourselves from falling victim to them in the future. See if you can spot the first one she uses. Just the bully narrative is crazy. And the things that have, people are saying to me, like, if you were upset because you thought I called him corny and those are the things that you're rebuttaling with, it's like, uh... The crime and the punishment, that if, if that's what you thought I said, it doesn't even match up. She takes the route of denial, and she is essentially saying that what I've been accused of by Michael is not what I did. She's conflating the reaction that the public had to her with what Michael B. Jordan said to her. Michael B. Jordan didn't say anything to her that wasn't true. It was the public who could have misconstrued it. However, for her benefit, she is making the implicit argument that because she feels that the public's reaction to her was undeserved and blown out of proportion, she takes the opportunity to conflate this with what Michael Michael B. Jordan actually said to her, painting the picture that everything is blown out of proportion, including the extent of what he said to me. Her first cue of deception here, the first part in the second machine of deception awareness, is the intentional conflation of events. However, it is what she does next in her second tactic that really takes it to the next level. The narrative is definitely so pushed. I, I feel like I admitted exactly what I said. And then even those words got turned around. Even if she does succeed in convincing people with this conflation, with the idea that she didn't say anything as bad as to the extent of what people think she says, she still fails to apologize and or acknowledge what she did do. She succeeded partially in shaving down the size of her problem in some people's eyes, but she's treating it like she got rid of the problem completely. We will touch on this in more detail very soon, but it is because of this that she ends up losing even more people from her side. The second part of this machine is to be aware of the all or nothing strategy. This next trick she implements is very sneaky, so carefully see if you can spot how she disassociates herself from the situation. FYI, we went to school together for one year. So the narrative that I bullied him all throughout high school, this was seventh grade. We were like 12 years old and everybody made fun of each other. We made fun of each other. That was school, you know, that was one year. Again, I've never bullied him. By stressing that they were 12 years old and that everyone made fun of each other, she is attempting to make the judgment toward her seem less acceptable given her young age. And she is trying to eliminate this bully notion by implying that I'm not some cruel outlier. Everyone was doing it. Now, this is mostly justified for a young kid who doesn't know better. However, it is not this, but what she emphasizes next that is super revealing. While stressing twice that it was only one year and downplaying its significance, she fails to mention that it was only one year because she had to move schools, likely for interesting reasons, as she implies right here. And it was so funny because the first thing she said to me was, 
Oh my, I thought we went to high school together. Michael B. Jordan was in our high school. And I'm like, no, I went to like six different high schools. You know, I was a, I was an interesting one back then. However, this doesn't help her case. So here's how she spins it to her benefit. By stressing that it was only one year, she tries to imply that it was only one year because of some sort of transformation. When the truth is that it was likely only one year because she had to change schools and literally wasn't even near him anymore. Anymore. The third part of the machine of deception awareness is to notice the downplaying of significance. If you have noticed, pretty much this whole time she has had a smile on her face. Her upcoming closing statement is super fascinating because it's extremely dramatic but intelligently placed and it reveals everything we need to know. Uh, it's crazy to me when people are like, well, even when they listen to the audio, it's like, well, you didn't defend him when you called when she called him corny and I'm like and he's not defending me right now when everybody's calling me a bully because he knows I'm not she says you didn't defend him when you called him corny and he's not defending me right now when everyone's calling me a bully because he knows I'm not when people make fun of others in front of us, our lack of objection is often indicative of compliance and agreement. However, the exact moment when she says, because I'm not, she attempts to flip the narrative completely. She attempts to send the implicit message that her original lack of objection and silence towards the corny statement was not her agreeing to it, but instead saying implicitly that that's so not true, and it's so not true to the extent that I don't even need to respond. It also then allows her to implicitly make the argument to the audience that Michael was also silent in this same way, and following my logic, he does does not think I'm a bully. Therefore, you are not justified in feeling this way towards me. The fourth part of the deception awareness machine is to be aware of manipulated interpretation. This being her closing line is a dramatic and almost effective way to go out, but the audience rightly does not buy it. As an overall strategy here, she attempted to completely abnegate herself of any responsibility through the following method. Choosing the route of downplaying and denying instead of downplaying and apologizing is much more polarizing, high risk, and has the potential to either win your audience over completely or lose them completely. Whereas when you downplay and then apologize for some of the stuff, it is much less polarizing and the audience tends to be more divided on their forgiveness instead of completely unified against you. The final part of this machine of deception awareness is noticing the effects of complete denial versus partial acceptance. We can tell from her smile this whole time that she is taking this risky all or nothing approach. The belief that nothing or all was done wrong and it doesn't work. After learning how to confront people who are fake towards us, how do we disagree with people who are genuinely on our side? If we can't learn to disagree peacefully with those in our circle, then it's almost impossible to sustain the relationship. The SIB method is a bulletproof way to disagree with others in a way that gets them to love us. If you want to exclusive insight into how the comedian Bill Burr implements this method effortlessly, click the video on screen now. My name is Glidget Ronan, and I'll see you on the other side.